Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to the newest episode of Uncovering the Underground Radio Podcast Show, brought to you by my company's Brutal Business Entertainment and Celestial Oddities Radio. As always, I will be your host on this enthralling and encapsulating journey into underground entertainment, from music to modeling to stars of the screen to comedy and oddities and everything in between. I am your host, Reverend Freighter Crow, and I want to thank you for listening in tonight. Whether you are listening live, streaming after the fact, or you've downloaded this to your device for on the go, I do want to thank you for your patronage and support. Make sure you click the like, share, and follow button on whatever platform you're listening to us from, from iTunes to iHeartRadio, Spotify, Deezer, Spreaker, CastBox, Amazon Podcasts, or Google Play, and any other platform out there that I might have missed. We are on all, so feel free to check us out where you feel most comfortable, but by clicking and sharing those like, you know, clicking the like, share, and follow buttons, rather, it moves us up the podcast community rankings, allows more people to discover the show, keeps you in the loop as new episodes air, and gives you unfiltered access to our past archives. Folks, there is something for absolutely everyone out there. Whether it be this show and we're just bringing on a slew of different types of guests of underground entertainment, as I already mentioned, to my show Nights of the Nephilim, where we bring on world-famous occultists and authors, or it'd be Celestial Oddity's Pair of Normal Guys podcast, where we talk over subject matter and phenomena in the paranormal and supernatural worlds. We have a lot of different episodes and guests, a lot of different information and teachings, and we are right around almost the 250-hour marker with our show, and I think around 100, getting upwards of 140 episodes total that we've we've released under Celestial Oddities Radio. So thank you guys all for your love and support. It does mean more to me than you realize. I am so happy to have you guys all tuning in each and every week and supporting what I do and what my company does, and we just have a lot of fun with it. Always bringing on great and fun guests, and tonight is no different, so stick around and we'll jump into who we have on this evening here in just a couple moments. If you've missed any of our past episodes over the last several weeks, we did kick off with Season 2 here on Uncovering the Underground, and tonight we're on Episode 9. So thank you so much for tuning in the last nine. If you've missed them, jump back. We've had guests from Razakal, Horcore Underground Queen, to Jacob Lee Pauly or Jake Lee Pauly. Uh, Jeremy Lee Pauly, why do I call him Jacob? Jeremy Lee Pauly, who's an anthropodermist bibliopagist, um, he you know is the world specialist in binding books and human skin. We have had on angelic desolation, and you just name it, shockwave theory, all kinds of great bands and great guests. We have a great lineup coming up for you as well. So make sure you stick around for that. But if you missed any past episodes, you can jump back and check them out. Not only this season, but season one, we had 65 episodes, 65 different guests. So a lot of great stuff out there. Now, if you do want to tune in with us during the show and not only listen, but also join us, you can leave comments, feedback, or ask our guests questions by going through Spreaker. That is our hosting company. You can check them out at Spreaker.com or through the Spreaker app on the app market. That is S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, so like speaker with an R. If you type in Uncovering the Underground, Celestial Oddities, any of that, you'll find our platform, you'll find our show lists. You can click on tonight's episode, which will say live next to it, and join us. We'd love to have you be a part of the show. We have some people tuning in already, leaving comments. Feel free to be one of them. Now, tonight we have a good friend of mine and someone we've had on the show before. I think this is actually his third time on the show, so you must know I like him if if I brought him back three times. I think he's the only guest so far that's ever made it back a third time. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to be able to do that and have him on this evening. And who I'm talking about is my good friend Patrick, a.k.a. the Rooster of Pittsburgh Pittsburgh Alternative Metal Band Nine Stitch Method and Industrial Metal Trap Metal Project, Seethe. Now, I would go into all the other projects he's a part of as well, but we only have an hour and a half tonight, folks, so we're going to keep it short because this man is involved in like 5,000 other projects that are all dope as hell, so I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about that this evening. But before he does, make sure that you crack open a few beers, light up your joints, kick up your feet, and join us as we uncover the underground with my good friend, the rooster. How you doing tonight, brother? Oh, we're doing pretty good, buddy. How we doing over there? 
Oh, no complaints, man. I mean, it's been a little bit of a wacky week, wacky day, as I told you earlier. You know, even the news was talking about there's a pretty bad stomach bug going around. My wife's throwing up. My two kids are shitting everywhere. It's been a wild day just trying to trying to get to the point where we could get on the radio tonight. But luckily, everything worked out for the normal time slot. We are able to get on here and talk about some good quality entertainment and information. So thank you for joining me. Oh, not a problem, brother. It's always a pleasure to be on the show with you. It's been a while, man. Even though you've been on three times, I mean, I don't know. I can look up the date yeah. while we're talking, but the last time has been I, at least I a think couple the years. The last time I was on the show, it would have been May, May or June of 2020. Okay. We're, we're, it's creeping up on the two year mark. It was right whenever we were kind of transitioning over the, uh, the whole brutal business thing with you stepping out and me kind of you know, right. the filling the shoes and whatnot. I do remember that now. Minute. Yeah, so it would have been, yeah, probably right around May of 2020. So, yeah, we're looking at almost a two-year marker. It's just crazy how quick things go by. Um, just wow. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing thinking about it because it's like, where the hell did two years go? But then you sit back and you look at everything that's happened. It feels like five years worth of happenings have gone on. You know what I'm saying? And it's that like, is what's weird oh, about it. I agree with that because it, you, you do think like, man, where the hell has the last couple of years gone? Like it feels like a blur. It's went by quickly. But then when you really sit and think about the last two years, you're like, oh, my God, it was an eternity. So it's weird to have that double-edged sword like it was quick, but it was also extremely slow and painful. Yes. Strange. Yeah, one hundred percent. Well, we're certainly going to dive into a little bit about that this evening. I mean, I don't want to touch base on it too much because there's so much more to talk about than just Brutal Business. But obviously, last we talked to you, you had taken over Brutal Business. I had stepped down, and you filled those shoes greatly. I mean, you you brought a lot to the label that the label didn't have prior to me. You were able to do a lot with artists and bringing people on that I was not able to and just did really a great job, not only overall, but during one of the most stressful and complex times in our, <laughs> our lifetime. Um, you know, hopefully that hopefully in our whole lifetime, I don't want this shit to happen again, but, um, you. you know, I, I give you kudos for what you've done, but I mean, why don't we recap just slightly on the fact how, was taking over the ownership and management of a label at the caliber of brutal business that many artists of different backgrounds and natures models video game stream team horror review column all of that and trying to manage that while keeping yourself sane while having a family while taking care of your own music and projects during a global pandemic why don't you share a little bit about that with us it it was really crazy because Oh, man. And it's weird, too. Like, what we were just saying, like, I only had, I was only running Brutal Business for, like, I think it was a year and a half whenever we made the announcement in December. But it felt like so much longer than that. Um, And the thing was, was right whenever I first started coming into the leading role of the company, we had, like we just said, we had COVID was just becoming a thing. uh, And that was really rearing its head. There was the Black Lives Matter uh, riots that were going on. It was just all kind of stuff like that. Everything was flipped on its head. You know, everybody isolated at home, not knowing what the hell is going on. Uh, riots and all kind of political stuff going on. It was just a, <laughs> it was a crazy, crazy time. Um, and the thing about it was, and it, I, I, you know, I think I can say the same for everybody. Everything was flipped on its head. Everything we knew how to do and operate, it, it was gone. And it was like, okay, like, what do we do from here? Like, is this just going to last a couple months? You know, cause at the beginning, everyone was like, Oh, like, because things, let me see, we had the horror con show that would have been in March of 2020. And then COVID after that, it started to really rear its head in the United States. And it was kind of like, okay, like we're all just going to stay home for two weeks and it's going to go back to normal. And then it was another month, then another month. And it was like, what the hell are we doing? You know? <laughs> and then, like I said, in that time too, you you add on the the black uh, lives matter, Black Lives Matter riots, and I and I say that because one, like over brutal business, like we we had people of all different kind of ethnicities and background and whatnot, you know, and it was just a very heated time politically, and it's one of them things, especially in this day and age, you know, uh, you have to watch, especially if we're on a platform like this. You have to watch what you say. You have to watch everything you do because if one person 
see something they don't like and it, 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 you get blackballed, you know, that shit, it spreads like wildfire, cancel culture and all that stuff. And I, I've watched a lot of that stuff happen over the years. It was just, it was, it was painstaking. It was like, what the hell are we going to do? But we, we charged through, we pushed through the best we could. Um, you know, we tried to, you know, shows weren't a thing. So we tried embracing the internet and pushing the envelope even further than what we had before with that, you know, uh, reaching out to podcasts, uh, online, you know, online radio stations, YouTube channels, you know, to review the artists and whatnot. You know, we were trying to dig into everything and anything that would give somebody coverage. And really them kind of people, stuff like this, you know, were really what carried, started to carry the torch. And it was then too, over that era where you really started to see the rise of Twitch. You know, a lot of people embracing that as a platform and whatnot, really taking the ball and running with it, you know. So, but <laughs> it was crazy, dude. It was crazy to say the least. Well, a couple of things I want to mention on that is, is first and foremost, yeah, I think, well, a few things actually. You know, you said that everybody thought that it was going to take or just be a couple of weeks. And I think that really was the overall mentality of the country and of the world. Okay. There's this wild thing here. It's hitting. It is serious. But, you know, we've become so accustomed to what's the next big thing. It's a big news item. We're going to deal with it for a couple of weeks or a month, and then it's gone. And I think, you know, it hit in March. April came. Okay, it's going to be done. Then May came, and people were like, oh, shit, this, this is serious. June came, July, August, and people were like, what is happening? And then it just it was like a never ending nightmare and just kept going on and on and on and on. And I mean, still we're not fully out of it. So that's one thing I wanted to comment on is I do think people thought it was going to end very quickly. Second thing, as you said, you have to be careful. And when I say you, I'm saying you to everyone else out there. I I don't include myself in that. I feel bad for you guys because you have to be careful with what you say, how you present yourself and what you do, because there's so many people out there that want to cause shit and blackball you. Folks, I don't give a fuck if you like what I say, and I will say whatever I want. So for Skippy Ickham and for Freighter Crow, that's not an issue. You get what you get when you listen to me, whether you like it or not. But for anybody else out there that worries about that, that worries, oh my God, they could cause problems and shut down my my artistry or my music or my modeling or whatever it might be, that is a serious thing. I'm not an artist anymore. I'm on the radio, and you know, you think that that would really worry me that they could shut me down. They ain't shutting me down. I'm self-produced. So you're getting me unfiltered. So that's the second thing I wanted to throw out there. But no, you you nailed it, man. There's a lot that you had to face. And one of the funny things that you said to me is, Skip, I almost feel like you had some type of premonition to jump out when you did. And the funny thing is, is jokingly, that does sound funny. Like, man, he jumped out right before COVID hit. Like he knew it was coming. Now, I didn't know it was coming, but through my occult workings, I had for a while been thinking about stepping down, as you know, or been thinking about changing it up. I didn't know if I wanted to do this anymore. So that was already on my mind, but I did working and I did get a clear cut message, end it and end it now. And it was a very direct and solid, very forceful message from the spirits that I work with. They were saying, end it and end it now. And it was literally the next day I ended it. Um, And I was like, I'm done. I'm leaving the label. We're over. Um, We're not, we're over, but I'm over. You do you want to, do you want to take this over? (laughs) Well, we were, well, I remember when, when all that was happening because we had been in talks kind of like, you know, the beginning of 2020, really, really early 2020. And it was kind of like, okay, like, you know, I'm kind of just seeing where things go, you know, maybe by, you know, July, I'll be, you know, like, I'll be handing it off to you and everything. And then it was just one day you're like, bro, the universe just told me I'm done. I'm sending you everything over the next couple of days. Skippy is out. And it it was like, oh, it was crazy, man. (laughs) I did a very deep working and a lot of the workings that I do is, is, you know, the spiritual invocation or evocation of actual entities. And after I will call them forward and be working with them, I do go into a meditative state and try to absorb any messages that they might want to communicate to me. And I had done that not concerning the music at all. 
I had done that just in general on other matters. And in my meditative state after the conjuration, I had gotten a very strong visual and audible telepathic message saying, pull the cord, the ejector cord, pull it now and get out now. And it wasn't saying it like something to consider. It was telling me you do it and you do it now. Now is the time. So I, you know, pretty much told you, okay, I'm done. It's yours. I'm out. And everybody was like, what the fuck? And then it was like, I don't even know how many days later it was like the world is stricken by COVID-19 virus and it's ravaging the planet. And now hundred percent dude. And I'm like, fucking a, I'm like, they, they gave me a message at the right time because I, w- I already was in a place where I needed to be done with this and mentally wasn't in a good place with just managing all these artists and all these things and all the projects I was involved with for years and years and years on end. So whenever I left and that happened and that hit, I'm like, oh, that's the reason they told me to bail out because that would have probably been, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. I probably would have snapped. And it was just so funny because I left right at the beginning and then you kind of decided to leave right towards the tail end, even though we didn't know COVID was over. You're like, I'm done. I'm out. Do you want this back? Because that was part of our condition whenever whenever you took over is, hey, if you're going to end it, I would like the chance to maybe consider keeping it again. And it was so weird. You came to me and it really wasn't the best time for me either. But I'm like, you know what? Yeah. And I'm going to change it up and start a whole new chapter of Brutal Business. And it was within weeks, COVID just started dropping down. Right after Christmas, it got big and then it dropped. Um, and, and I'm like, I'm like, I, I left when it started. I came back in when it quick. For those listening, literally, literally, we're talking about him getting this clear, vivid message. And, you know, he, he, he did the talk. He was like... I'm out. I got all the signs I need to know. I'm dipping out. Literally, this man signed me over everything. And within like two or three days later, boom, <laughs> shut down. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? What is going on? <laughs> Thanks to my spirit guides that I work with. Um, they really came through on that one. And they have come through multiple times in many areas of life. And, and that's why I am so connected to the powers that I work with, because they do give me insight on a lot of things. And I'm very blessed for that. Um, but it was just funny that I left right before it kicked in. And then you're like, I'm out. And I took back over and they're like, OK, everything's going back to normal now. And I'm like, yes. I took it back right at the right time. Um, so thank you. But no, I give you kudos, man, for everything you did over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you for being able to help the artists that were on the label. Much love to everybody that was on the label. Um, for those listening out there that might not have known, I have taken back over the company, but under the umbrella of new entertainment. It's my three radio shows, my oddities um, company, my paranormal investigations and teachings, and my occult workings and lodge. So it's no longer music, modeling, anything like that, other than the fact that I'm bringing on musicians like this on Uncovering the Underground and authors and other things on my other shows. But we are switching up how the company is producing enter- entertainment. But I am happy to to have my baby back. And I thank you for obviously taking care of her this whole time. And you did a phenomenal job because you were able to – reach into areas that I didn't have a lot of success in, reaching into other podcasts, reaching into other clothing companies. Those were things that either fell to the wayside because I just didn't have enough time and was stretched too thin, or I just never was able to do it successfully. Um, So, you know, you did a very, very good job. So much love to the artists out there that were on the label. I hope that you enjoyed your experience with Brutal Business and that it helped shape you into the artist that you are today and to the artist you'll become tomorrow. So thank you. Now, why don't we jump into some other topics here? I mean, during this time, you not only was continuing to work with your band Nine Stitch Method, but you had started a couple different side projects, one of which is something that we'll be featuring tonight on the show, which is Seethe, um, and that is your your trap metal slash industrial electronic sounding um, project that you kind of launched in that in that interim of that time period. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Seed? Yeah, man. Uh, Seed is one of them things. Whenever everything went down with COVID, um, I'd kind of started writing. I I started writing some of that stuff uh, pre-COVID, like right at the beginning of 2020. And it's one of them things, you know, even though Nine Stitch is only a two-man band, uh, you know, I'd always wanted to do some kind of solo work. 
but it's one of them things, one motivation, and it's it just not having the, it, you know, it, it, it's one thing when you're with somebody, you know, you're writing, you're bouncing ideas back and forth, you know, if you have a bad idea or if you're giving off bad takes, you know, you have somebody else to kind of keep you in the rain. But when you're doing that, like you're by yourself and you're just kind of like, yeah, you can send stuff to people, you know, check it out, tell me what you think. But I mean, you're really all on your own when it comes to uh, quality control and everything at the end of the day. And when I started doing that, um, writing the first EP, Blueprints for Introspection, um, it was very new. It was kind of a different take on just trap metal and industrial music, electronic music, you know. It was very Queen of the Dam inspired, but I didn't really know how far I was going to go with it, you know. It was just kind of a thing to do to kind of pass the time while we weren't getting together to have band practice and shows and stuff, you know, because in the beginning we all thought COVID was just going to be done in, in a couple of weeks to a month, you know, and it just kept going. And I, I had needed something to keep my sanity. So I began writing C's um, and doing that. I began to fortunately, thankfully do a lot of freelance vocal work with people all over the globe, having me feature on projects and stuff with them. It's really been a it's been a crazy couple years. It, in five years, going from some starting vocals where I sucked, people told me to you know to stick with guitar. You ain't got it vocally to working with people all around the globe. You know, it's been a really you know while I, I'm confident in my abilities, I don't believe I'm the best. I don't have a big ego about it, but like it, it's been a really crazy transformation to say the least. Well, you know, something I would like to touch on that is, you know, that is true. Um, you know, in a five-year span, your five-year track record is pretty damn impressive, brother. I mean, not only have you formed your own group and you have played out avidly, you have played with a lot of headliners, you mm -hmm. have featured on tracks with many different um, groups and projects and even vocalists, which we'll get to soon. You have started other side projects of your own. You were on a you know, pretty successful label and then became the owner and manager of that label. You have left that label and now have been um, you know, added to the roster of another very good label. I mean, in a five-year span, that is a hell of an impressive record. Where it's been most, crazy, dude. It's been a wild ride, to say the least. Well, most people's first five years are, are jack shit. I mean, it's it's complete dog <laughs> shit. You're 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 just working to try to get out there and really even get a few shows and even get some notice. I mean, it 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 doesn't happen often where you're able to do what you've done in the five years. Now, I will say though, there is now a much different time, and you hit on that. Where if COVID would have happened. 15 years ago, it would have went down a lot differently because now there's been such advances in technology for people to have home studios to record themselves, to send tracks to one another across the planet and make projects or to formulate ideas while they're stuck in their home for two years to form a project. Like I said, hey, man, you're a friend of mine. You're a great guitarist. You want to be a part of a project with me, I'll do vocals, and hey, I have a buddy that does drums in Connecticut, and you start to connect these pieces, and you can do it, do it properly through social media and talking and Skype and Zoom and all these things that are out there, you can record and send to one another, and you can promote it and market it yourself properly and efficiently and get views. Now, if you go back 15, 20 years, it would have been really hard to try to communicate to each other avidly and appropriately. Your recordings at home would have sucked dog dick. They would have sounded like absolute garbage. And I can tell you that because I was recording 15 years ago on Audacity free download on, you know, Audacity. Windows 98. And it sounded like <laughs> I recorded in a coffee can. But that's what we had. The only people that I knew that were recording at home with that really, you know, good quality were the rich kids. They were the kids that whose mommy and daddy were millionaires, and they were like, "Oh, well, I got, I got, um, oh, what's the what's the yeah. uh, what's the Mac? What's the not Pro? Well, Pro Tools was one of them too, but there's the other one, uh, Logic. Uh, They're like, oh, yeah. I got Logic, and I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, rich kid. Um, so that, those were the you know ones recording on high end things back then, but it was very few and far between. 
and we didn't have those choices. The only choices we had were to go to a studio, and most of the time it was kind of a shittier studio because we couldn't afford the high-end ones. You're getting charged by the hour, and you spend $1,000 to put out a three-song demo, you know, and it sounds decent, but now you're broke, your band broke, and you're not doing anything for a while because that $1,000 when you're 16, 17 years old is is all you have, you know what I mean? You guys scrapped together for months to do that, and now you're not going to do anything for a while. So it's just a different time now that anyone has the advantage to be able to record at home, to start projects with friends across the world, to market, promote, and communicate with one another. So that is a really cool thing um, that this happened when it did because as much as we want to bitch about it, as much as we want to complain, we got Netflix. We got movies and shows on demand. We got Hulu. We got Amazon. We got Amazon Music. We got, you know, Spotify. We have everything. We we got Pornhub. You know what I mean? We got whatever we want, folks, all at the touch of our finger on demand. So while we're like, this sucks, I'm trapped in my house. Well, you're trapped in your house with all the advantages of the world. Go back 30 years and be trapped in the house, asshole, and then see what you got. You got a radio and an old-ass, big-ass TV. And whatever DVDs or VHS you happen to have. And you got to hope there's no scratches on it because that shit will not work. Yes, sir, 100%. <laughs> So, no, I just think that that's interesting, man, because you've been able to really reach out. I mean, we talked about seed, but I, one of the things I just mentioned a few moments ago was the fact that you got the opportunity to not only work with other bands and projects, but you got the opportunity to be a part of a Guinness Book of World Records song featuring the most vocalists ever on one track in history. Yes, sir. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that track? That was pretty cool. Uh, the band um, that was for Nihilist. Uh, Nihilist is a solo deathcore project by Mr. Fred Nihilist. I don't know his last name. It's just what he goes by on social media. Uh, that was just something that I had happened to see. It was in a um, it was in a Facebook group. People were talking about it, and I was like, "Okay, all right, that's kind of cool. Whatever." And I, you know, a couple weeks went by and I kept seeing it and kept seeing it and kept seeing it. And I was like, you know what? Like, fuck it. I'm going to throw my hat in the mix and see what this is all about. And I actually nabbed one of the very last spots of that. And I, there were, there was, there's all kind of levels of people in that track, man. Um, there's like Will Ramis from Lorna Shore, uh, the dude from like I declare, well, you know, a bunch of big, big top tier deathcore acts. Uh, then you know, you kind of go down the little guys like me on the bottom. You know what I'm saying? But it was, uh, it was cool. And pretty much like everybody gets like a little sentence, and they get a timestamp. We would record our vocals and then ship it in, and then homie would punch it in. It was eh, pretty fucking badass, dude. And not only did he break the Guinness Book of World Records with that, I'll give this to Fred too. He pretty much made his own like little community if you will of all these vocalists and people coming together for this project like it, it was it's pretty cool dude i, I nyla 666 i uh i am vocalist number 612 but i highly recommend uh people going and checking that out dude it's pretty cool a lot of work went into that project fred did an amazing job keeping everything organized and answering any questions we had um he's doing some pretty badass shit himself nowadays he just released his new ep apart so nihilist, go check that out. So folks, if you are listening out there, I do ask that you go check the song out because it is a work of art. Not only because it broke the Guinness Book of World Records and there was a, you know, a lot of great things that Patrick just said about it, but this man is fucking crazy. And by this, I'm not talking about Patrick. I'm meaning the guy that put this together. Fred, as Patrick just said. Because if anybody has ever mixed down volume or <laughs> mixed down stem files for vocals, excuse me. It's a lot of work. The mm -hmm. more, the more yes, stems sir. you have, the more vocals you have, the more layers you have, the more work it is. When you were talking about having 666 vocalists on one track. Now, as Patrick said, it's only a line here and there. It's, it's very quick blips. All together as one song. But that is a shit ton of work. 
So much so that I never in my life would want to do that. That just sounds horrible to me. That sounds painful. It sounds like not it, – it, to me, I love putting in work and producing things for you guys. Never in my life would I do that. So kudos to you, Fred, for putting together something absurd. It is an awesome track. If you haven't listened to it, folks, check it out. Nihilist666 on YouTube. You can pull it up. And you will listen to 666 metal vocalists all together on one track. And it's pretty cool. And as Patrick said, there's a lot of great names on there that uh, he got to feature alongside of and it built a community. And you can reach out to any one of those vocalists at any time, brother, and say, hey, man, I was on that track with you, Nihilus 666. And that's your bridge right there. They talk about icebreakers. That's your icebreaker. Because they're going to talk to you and be like, oh, what's up, bro? And then you can be like, you ever want to feature on my track? And then that you can, you have an endless Rolodex of vocalists that you can now potentially work with. Yep, 100%. 100%. And what was even crazier about that, like I said, we're talking about 666 vocalists. Like when we did that, I, I had no idea what to expect, what all he wanted from it. I didn't know if like I was going to get to do like different layers of vocal tones. And he was like, no, no, no. I need two takes doubled up and they need to be the same pitch because if it, if it's more than one tone, they could count it as a different vocalist or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So it, it, we sent that, you know, we didn't like my, my vocal timestamp, I think was like 56, 19 to 56, 23. And we, all we did was just send him our little, we sent him a little reference track of the block we did and then we just sent him the the take. Like it wasn't just he downloaded it and it drops in. Like he had to line everything up. Like it's just insane. Insane. <laughs> 666 vocal takes times two. This man had to line all that shit up and it sounds fucking good. Like he did an amazing job on it. I mean I can't even I can't even comprehend that. Six hundred and sixty five and all I did was record burying what was what you know that's all i had to do <laughs> so, so let's 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 break down that together folks if it's 666 vocals times two stem files that's it's 12 it's 13 it's it'd be 1332 so that's 1332 am i doing that right 1000 yeah 1332 that sounds right um vocal tracks can you imagine for anybody out there that does any mixing that's listening right now they're like fuck no there ain't no way 1332 um so that's pretty dope man i am glad that uh, you were able to be a part of that project that you were able to do all the projects you've done over the last two years um because you've been a part of some great ones and i think now is a perfect time to jump into our first song and we do have three different ones that you've sent me over this evening which one would you like to jump into I'll tell you what, we were just talking about Seath. We'll go ahead and, and do Seath. All right, folks. Well, this is from Patrick's side project called Seath. This is Dislocate, and we'll be right back after this on Uncovering the Underground. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
right, folks, we're back on Uncovering the Underground, and that was Dislocate by artist Seethe, a.k.a. Patrick the Rooster, also of Nine Stitch Method, who we've been hanging out for the last 35 minutes together, a longtime friend, guest three times on the show. That's right, folks, three. He's the only one so far that's been back the third time, like I said. So stick around, listen to the rest of the episode with us. We'll be showcasing... Obviously, the song we just played there, Dislocate, will be playing a song from his band, Nine Stitch Method, and another side project we'll be jumping into here shortly called South of Clarity, talking over many different things here in the next hour, and uh, we're glad to have you listening in. If you want to leave comments, ask our guest questions, you can do so through Spreaker.com or the Spreaker app, as we mentioned before. If you have suggestions of what you want to see us do on the show, not do on the show, do differently. People you want to see us have on the show or anything in between, you can drop us a line at celestialoddities at gmail.com. Again, that is celestialoddities at gmail.com. The Uncovering the Underground Facebook group page or the Freighter Crow page, which is my personal page. I answer everyone daily. I answer everyone quickly. So you never have to worry about being ignored. You will always get an answer from me, even if it's, hey, fuck you, guy. You're still going to get something back from me because that's the type of guy I am. So, Patrick, I love the fact that you did this project. I love the fact that you are so versatile in what you do, whether it's your own project. And I love the fact that also you just said, you know what? Working with five other individuals or four other individuals sucks. So we're going to form a group with just two of us. And I'm going to do side projects with just myself. Because as a solo artist, someone who wasn't a band for many years, I I miss working with my brothers. I miss being with the five of us all together and out on the road. But at the same time, I only say that because I haven't had it for a while. It's like when you're single. You miss having a woman. But then when you have one, you're like, what the fuck was I thinking? You know what I mean? Like, you, you think about that. It's, that's the shit people don't want to say, but it's the truth. You think about like, oh, man, I really miss having a girl. And it, it only takes like a month of having one to be like, wow, I fucking made a mistake. You know, so it's the same thing with a band. When you're with you're thinking about being with band members, you wish you were. But then when you are, you're like, these guys suck. I don't like them. And I talk about this all the time and people laugh because when you're on the road with your brothers time and time again, city after city, night after night, you, you think about what ways you might be able to sne- secretly snuff them on the road and no one will know. And when you're a solar project, you don't have to worry about that. And that's the reason I became Skippy Yickum because I'm like, I'm done working with fucking other people because they all suck. Um, and we're talking high caliber musicians I've worked with. And, and I'm just like, you know what? I, I don't care to work with anybody else but myself and unless I'm doing a collab, but to work with day in and day out and count on people showing up for practice and rehearsals and, and not fucking up the show because they're drunk or they're tripping on LSD or anything like that that I've experienced over the years is nice. So I give you kudos to find a way around that but still be able to be out and performing and be able to do something beyond just a a rap project or just a one man band. You've done that yourself, but you also have Josh and nine stitch method to be able to do that. So kudos to you for finding kind of a middle ground. Yeah. It's been a weird journey to say the least because I, you know, I've played in bands. I've played in bands for years. But when in 9SN, it wasn't supposed to be what it's become today. Like, it was just supposed to be like a recording project. You know, we were just passing emails back and forth. And Yeti had randomly been like, oh, hey, I got us our first show. Because his band, 5 a.m. at the funeral home, they operated as the two man, you know, like, and I was kind of like, eh, like, I, I don't know. We could try it. And a lot of people were really, really against it and told us we couldn't do that. And we were, and I'll be real with you, we were dog shit in the beginning. It was bad. But as time went on, I, we, you know, we were just like, you know, fuck other people. It's just us. We write the shit. You know, if we keep playing, we keep doing the grind, we'll get better. You know, let's, let's just keep, let's just keep going to hell with it. To hell what people say. And that's just kind of the mentality I've I've gone with. And it's been a learning curve. And it's funny because oh, as time has progressed, 
And, uh, you know, not that I'm, you know, I don't think I'm anything big by any means or, you know, anybody important, but a lot of people come to me in Yeti and they're like, yo, man, like, that's really cool. Like, what, how do you guys do that shit? Because now, like, we have, like, we, we used to do everything all ourselves. And then I met Gus Wallner and kind of roped him in and he helps us on the production side of things, programming drums. Uh, he plays the bass on all of our tracks now. Like once we got him into the mix, like if you're not looking at 9SM on the stage, you think that it sounds like there's a full fucking band up there. Like we got it tweaked and dialed into the T. And it, people, and a lot of people are like, like I'm thinking of doing this. Like what's your, like what, what's your take on it? And I'm just like, don't do it. Just make a fucking band because <laughs> it's a lot of work, dude. You know, you got to make sure uh, you're in sync and you got to know how to work the crowd. That's something that to this day, you know, I still work on. I, I have some shows that are better than others, but you got to know how to work the crowd. You got to know how to be animated and energy. You know, you got to give them something to talk about and look at whenever you, you're only two bozos up on this big stage. You know what I'm saying? And we, we've been fortunate enough that we've had some success with it. You know, we, we've come a long fucking way we, with our craft and, you know, it's only been up from here, but it, it, it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> well, and it <laughs> is, I mean, you it's said it be, because you, hard. well, you think that it isn't. I mean, all right off the bat, people are like, well, there's only two of them, so it can't be too hard. But yes, I mean, there's two of them, but then they are having to work on the construction of songs as a full group with only two of them. When you bring Gus into the mix, he's adding in the drum samples. He's adding in the bass lines, actually playing the bass. And you're bringing a full band's production out between three individuals, one across the world and two here in Pittsburgh. And it's a very interesting dynamic. Shout out to Gus. Um, he does a wonderful job. I've personally never talked to the gentleman in my life, but I've watched from a distance at what he's done for you guys and with you guys and his production in general. And he's very good at what he does. So much love to you, brother, for what you've brought to this group. I got to say, and I'm not to beat a dead horse because I've told this story before. The first time I ever came out with you guys, I was performing as my solo project, Skippy Ickham, and it was in Butler, Pennsylvania. And it was with the band um, Over My Dead Body, and uh, I don't remember who else was there, but it was Over My Dead Body, you guys, me, and someone else. Drowning in Broken Glass, that's who it was. Drowning in Broken Glass, the guys from fucking Nazgul. And no one in the world right now knows what I'm talking about, but there used to be a band from Butler, Pennsylvania that was called Nazgul, and they were the most hardcore guys in the world. We played with them back with my band. And they were a bunch of old old heads, and they came out, and they were like, you guys are fucking dope, man. And I'm like, thanks, brother. You play in a band? I didn't realize they were the band that was playing that night. They're the ones that actually had us on the show. I just never met them. And they're <laughs> like, oh, yeah, bro, we're fucking Nazgul. And the way they said it, my band joked about for years. Um, we would always at practice be like, we're fucking souls of Aries um, just because this band was so hardcore and then they, some of those members formed uh, Drowning and Broken Glass I believe that one of their members don't quote me on this I believe is the drummer for my guest next week, Natasha Sarver. It's her drummer of her band now, which is Animus. I could be wrong, but I believe it is um, I'm pretty sure how that happened is when Drowning and Broken Glass split the new the band you're talking about, Animus. Um, I think it's like three quarters of Drowning in Broken Glass. I'm pretty sure Bob plays guitar. I know Lee's on guitar, and then Ethan Roberts uh, is on drums. So I'm pretty sure. It, yeah, I think like half half of Drowning in Broken Glass would go on to become Animus. Well, and I don't know all the members. I can't remember. There's just been too many bands over the years, but we always had a, we always had a killer time with that. Me, Ian, Zach Shepard, um, all of us. Fucking Nazgul. So shout out to those guys for being so goddamn hardcore back in the day. You know, like 15 years ago, being like they were like the Cannibal Corpse of local. You know what I mean? They, they didn't play like Cannibal Corpse, but I mean, like they were like those old heads that you were like, man, these dudes are fucking into it. Um, like Leprosy, who still plays to this day, like 36 years later here in Pittsburgh. These dudes have been playing forever. Um, you know, so much love to them. But, uh, no, that's where I first heard you. And the reason for this whole story was whenever you guys came out, and I've told this and you've laughed, 
I was like, look at these fucking assholes. Because I came from, you know, a death metal scene, and we were pretty successful, and I was involved with music and booking for a long time, and I didn't want to be a hater, but, I mean, I'm the first to tell people that I'm a very nice guy, but I'm also an asshole. And when I seen two-member metal band come out, a singer and a guitar player, no drums, no bassist, I looked at my wife, and I'm like, look at these fucking jerk-offs. And I'm like, these guys are going to suck. I'm like, I'm going to go outside. But I didn't. I stuck around for the first song I always do for any band. And if you're really horrible, I'll go outside. And I'll tell you you're good afterwards just to be a nice guy. And you guys started playing. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay. I, I'm digging it. The first song I was kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. But I don't know if I'm feeling it yet. And then I did what you said. I closed my eyes. I listened to it as if it was a full band without looking at you guys. And then I opened my eyes again, and I'm like, no, these dudes are dope. Now, I'll fast forward a little while later. My father, old head, loves music, got me into music, took me to all kinds of shows, used to mosh and beat the fuck out of kids at my shows. It was great. I love watching my dad jump into a pot of, you know, a mosh pit of a bunch of teenagers and fuck them all up. It was hilarious. Um, But he came to one of your guys' shows with me. I think either I was playing with you guys or he just came with me. I can't remember. It was right after you signed us. It was the microphone murder sessions. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. And I said, Dad, now listen, these guys are about to start. Close your eyes. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, just close your eyes. I said, I'll tell you when to open them again. They came on, and I talked to him at the bar with his eyes closed. I'm like, what do you think of these guys? He's like, they're pretty fucking good. I'm liking them. I let him listen for a little bit. I said, now open your eyes. And he looked at you guys, and he's like, there's just two of them? I was like, there's just two of them. What do you think? He says, I'm impressed. And, and I, I loved that. Because I'm like, yeah, that's the right way. As I says, you know what? You take away your dogmatic view of something that a band has to be four or five members. You take away that programming that we have. Because you program that to yourself. You feel what a band should be. There is no restrictions to what a band should be. And when you hear it like that, and then you open your eyes and see, you're like, oh, shit. So kudos to you guys for doing something so radically different than anything that I've seen locally or just in general and, and doing a very good job of it. Now, we have some cool. comments pouring in of people you know, saying, hello, how, how's everything going? Love listening to the show right now. Listening right now, horns up, all kinds of stuff pouring in. But we do have a comment from Dakota who you know, is a great, you know, great business mind, a great entrepreneur. He runs DI Records or called Devil Inside, though they don't call themselves that anymore. Um, and he runs a label with a lot of artists on it. And we're going to jump into that since he went ahead and commented. He said, Pat, you should tell that story about the good luck at the show tonight. I don't know if he mistyped or if that actually means something to you. That's it. That's it. That's it. Tell us the story. Okay, so this would have been pre-BBE days. Um, Yeah, and I know Sam was kind of starting to cut her teeth in the Pittsburgh music scene. Dakota and I, you know, we were – Kind of getting acquainted. Dakota was starting up. Oh, man. What was the original name of his company? Pittsburgh. I can't remember. It was whenever he first started his company. He was uh, doing, like, blogs and doing, like, voting contests and stuff for musicians and whatnot. Him and I were kind of getting tight. And he messages me randomly the one day. I didn't even think of it. Anything of that. He's like, good luck to the show tonight. It's a Friday. And I'm like do I have a fucking show tonight? <laughs> because you got to understand Dakota and I, his words, not mine. Him and I are like Shrek and donkey. Like we fight, we bicker like brothers, but like back in this stage of our friendship, like he never fucked with me or anything. He was always like super serious, super kind, you know, just very uh, about music. And I'm going back through my notes and everything. I'm like, are we supposed to play a fucking show tonight somewhere? And he got by me. And I, probably like a good 10 minutes. And I'm like, you fucker. I didn't have a fucking show tonight. He's just like, ah, you know, and he still, you know, he feels the need to bring it up five years later. I see you, Dakota. I see you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sweating my freaking. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to miss this. Freak. We're going to miss this show. Yet he's a freaking hour and a half away from Pittsburgh. <laughs> like, there ain't no way we're going to be able to pull this off. We're going to be late. We're going to cancel. Ah. Oh, yeah. 
You love that, though, man. The chaos. I love the chaos. I've talked about it on past episodes that I miss the chaos. Um, if I miss anything for the shows and people think I'm sick, performing was great. I kind of liked secretly the weird shit. I liked, and, I, and folks, you can understand, is Skippy Ickham. I did a lot of traveling and playing by myself. There was actually nights where I played three shows in one night. I would be the opener for one show, play midway through the set on another show, and headline the third show. Three different towns, not close to each other, no fans with me, no friends with me, wolf pack shit, leading, you know, but by that I don't mean pack, I mean like wolf leader shit, going by myself to shows, playing boom, 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 driving an hour in between. I would get home at four o'clock in the morning and just played three shows in one night. And it was chaos. It would be fucking brutal. I was showing up at shows when I first started that no one else would play. And I considered myself hardcore for that. I was showing up at clubs that were 99% black and I was the only white one there. And I was performing underground horrorcore to crowds that never really listened to horrorcore before. And most people thought I was crazy, but I told myself that if I'm going to break into the rap world, I'm going to fucking give it everything I have, work my ass off, make a name for myself, and I'm going to put myself in the most uncomfortable situations, not because I have a problem with being with that crowd, but because you're coming out in front of a crowd that wants to hear hip hop, and you're like, I'm going to talk about rape, murder, and cannibalism tonight. (laughs) And are they going to accept it or not? And they did. And they loved it. But I loved the chaos. I fed off the chaos. And I miss that. I don't miss playing. Yes, playing is great. I love performing in front of people. I don't miss that. I miss the chaos. I miss, like I said, finishing up with my band and the carrying the equipment out to the car down three flights of stairs, strapping it in, going down the highway, and you hear the amps start to roll around, and you're like, oh, shit, and you have to pull over on the side of the highway. I miss people coming by us looking like they're probably going to rob us at any moment and take our $10,000 worth of gear, and we have our guns on us, and like, are we going to die tonight? I miss the chaos. So... When you talk about the chaos of that night, it just makes me think of the chaos. I miss that. And I know that a lot of people out there listening are probably like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I don't care. That's what I'm into. And Let me ask you a question. As a rather seasoned performer, so, okay, when's the last time? Uh, last show you played was in September, right, with Razakal? Um, That sounds about yes, right. And we're going to go with that. Yeah, it sounds right. Okay. That's your last show. Did you get like the anxiety slash butterflies whenever you, you know, like pre like day of show butterflies and anxiety? You know, here's the weird thing, man. And, and I don't say this to sound hardcore. I've never gotten nervous before a show. And when people hear that, they're like, yeah, OK, man, that's cool. And I'm like, no, literally, you can ask my wife. I, I've never gotten nor- ner- nervous before playing a show. And they say, how is that possible? I'm like, I don't know. I just never felt the need for that emotion. I never felt the need to be scared or nervous to stand in front of a crowd and do what I do because I'm going to go out there and perform and they're going to either love me and if they do, fuck yeah, man, you're vibing at my level. We can connect. You can be a fan. We can be friends. Sure, we can build something together. Or you're not going to like it or think I suck and therefore I really don't give a fuck about your opinion anyway and, and it's meaningless. So there's nothing for me to lose. The only thing I can lose is the respect of a bunch of people I don't give a shit about. Or I can gain the respect about a bunch of people I don't give a shit about. And, and, and I know that sounds fucked up to people listening, and I don't care. I'm raw. I tell it how it is. So the way I looked at it is, is no matter when I go out, I'm going to do me. And as long as I walk off that stage happy with my performance, proud of the music that I performed that evening, I don't give a fuck if a single person liked it. That's the attitude I took into the battle arena when I battled. I knew I was going up against opposition that didn't give a shit about me. No one wanted to see the white boy win in a black circuit, and that was fine. I was okay with that. But I knew that for about a half an hour, they were going to listen to every fucking bar that I had to spit. All my weird Batman fucking venom spitting acid in your face type shit that these people were looking at me like, what the fuck is white boy talking about? They were going to listen to because it was me. I didn't care for acceptance. I only ever kept it real to me. So no, I never felt nervous. I never felt scared. And so many people are thrown off by that. 
And I don't know if that just makes me weird or that just makes me real. I don't know, but I never felt the need for that emotion. I'll be real with you. For me, I'm more, you see, you can put me in front. I think the largest crowd I've played in front of is five, 600 cap. I think, I think it was 600. I don't, I don't have an issue playing in front of 600 people that I don't know. But if you put me in a room with 20 people where I know half of them, dude, I'm just like, oh, because I got to face them again. You know what I mean? And they're just like, oh, good, 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 good job, buddy. You know, if you botched it or what, you know what I mean? But I've always been like that. Like the less people that I know that are there, the better and probably crazier I'm going to freaking go. Well, you know, I mean, I can understand that in a way. Um, because you care more about the opinions of the people you care about than the people you don't. Now, I'm an asshole. So like I said, I never give a fuck about the opinions of the people I care about either. So <laughs> so I walk out in front of them. I'm like, you know what? I, I mean, and that's just, I think that was just who I was as a person. But as Skippy Yickum as a character and as an artist, that's kind of what I took on is I was like, you know what? From day one, I am going to be the most respectful person that you will ever meet when I'm not on stage. But when I'm on stage, it's a whole different ball game. And people always were thrown off by that. I would walk off stage, shake hands. They'd be like, oh, man, dope performance. I'm like, thank you so much, sir, for standing here tonight and watching it. If you would like to step over to my merch booth, I have a ton of stuff for sale. would love you to check it out, even if you don't buy anything. And make sure you get home safe tonight, okay? And people would always be like, what the fuck? They're like, dude. That is not the way I expected you to be in real life. I'm like, what, did you expect me to be a psycho serial killer? Is that what you approach to shake hands with? And they're like, well, I guess not. I'm like, exactly. I'm like, I am up, up there performing a performance for you. I gave you a performance. I gave you the character that you wanted to see, but it doesn't mean that I am that character. And people always got really thrown off by that. Um but at the same time, I also am that character because I don't give a shit. So, I mean, it was just one of those weird things. Now, Pat, uh, D- you know, Dakota just left a comment and said, Pat can tell, or excuse me, let me try to read this properly because I'm reading it live. Pat can tell you this. I don't sign people just for their music. I sign the people first. Pat has shown himself to be an exceptional human being, not just as a musician who has great talent, not just with his music, but pushing others. Pat is a person worth investing in. Now, Dakota, I will agree with that because as I said on a recent video, and once again, don't give a shit who it offends, if I had seven lifetimes to make the decision of leaving Brutal Business seven more times and seven additional lifetimes, seven additional times, the person I would have handed my rulership of the company to would be Pat. I know there was a lot of people who had opinions of who they thought I should hand it to, other artists who thought that I should hand it to them, vice versa. And it's no hate against anybody. But I'm just telling you fucking flat out, it would be Pat every single time. None of you were in the mind state or in the proper place in your life to be able to run a company at this caliber. Everybody wants to be king until they're handed the crown and they feel the weight that it bears. And then they crumble very quickly. It takes a certain type of mindset. Now, you might think you have that mindset, but I know what people are at their root. And a part of that's because of the type of occult practices that I do. I see beyond your skin material manifestation. I see who you are as a spirit, as a being. And... I can tell whether or not you would be the right fit for things. And I weighed out everyone on my label, and there was only one clear answer, someone who stood strong amongst the herd. And that was Patrick. So I will make that very clear to everyone right now. And Dakota, I agree with you 100%. Very good individual, very good head on his shoulders, very good artist, and someone who deserves recognition. And much love to Dakota for being a very good person as well. Prior to any of the involvements that are happening nowadays, I talked to Dakota a couple years ago, became friends with him. We exchanged words with one another. We talked. Even in modern day, we still talk, even though I don't have much to do with artists anymore. I've always found him to be a legit guy, a good company owner, a good entrepreneur, and I don't like a lot of people. So, you know, I do like him. So much love to him. 
Now, we need to jump into another song. So we have either Nine Stitch Method, Corridor, or we have South of Clarity, Uncon... Oh, hold on. Songs at an unconventional... What is this? I can't even read my own fucking song, writing. Song, that, that, that's off of the uh, last BBE mixtape released at the end of 2021. Songs song of an Unconventional Hell. Yeah, I just couldn't read my own writing. That's my own fault. Which one do we want to jump into? Uh, you know, we were talking about Nine Stitch there. We'll go ahead and go with that song. Let's, and we'll talk a little bit more about that after the fact. Let's get it. So, folks, this is Nine Stitch Method from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This song is called Corridor, only on Uncovering the Underground. We'll be right back after this. Back on Uncovering the Underground Radio Podcast show, that was Nine Stitch Method based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That was their song, Corridor. I've been hanging out with their vocalist, Patrick, a.k.a. The Rooster, for the last hour. We've been talking about not only Nine Stitch Method, we've been talking about his side project, Seethe. We've talked about other projects that he's been a part of over the last two years and just general conversation. Hard to believe, you know, it's been over an hour already and we only got about a half an hour left. We might even go a little bit past fuck it i don't really care um but whatever you guys want we'll do much love to everybody tuning in right now if you love what you're hearing give them a like if you don't love what they're hearing send them a message and tell them they suck i don't care just give them some type of indication that you've checked them out tonight because that means a lot to them now brother i've always been a big fan of nine stitch method like i said other than the first 10 minutes i've seen you guys i've always been a big fan um, so, <laughs> so much love to what you guys do. I think you have a great voice. I think you take me back to whenever I was, you know, roughly 12 to 14 years old and I started getting into a lot of different bands, you know, that you take an influence from, from Corn to Static X, from mud vein to Marilyn Manson, you know, you, you, you bring a lot of that together for me, but with something that is also very unique and of yourself. And that is always a very special time for me. So when I listen to nine stitch method, it always reminds me of who I am and always reminds me of being young and being a teenager and that amazing and special moment in life. So I've never told you that before, but every time I listen to you guys and even you generally, but especially more on the metal side than the seethe, it reminds me of me. And it reminds me of me as a 14-year-old high school student and the music I listened to and the way that music made me feel back then. So thank you. 
Oh, thanks, brother. <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a pretty goddamn good compliment coming from you. I'll take that. We're gonna chalk that one up. Yeah, like I'm it. feeling I'm feeling open tonight to talk. Whether it's just the love in the air, whether it's just the truth in the air, or whether it's the three IPAs I just drank, I don't know. <laughs> but any way of the sort, folks, it is true. A hundred percent. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Now, you know. It has been a wild ride, brother. I mean, we have we have gone through the storm together from the time you joined Brutal Business to the managing of Brutal Business to now to everything in between those stages of growth as a unit, as individuals, um, to where you are now. So why don't you tell us a little bit, since we were talking about Dakota, we were talk, talking about his label, label, how all did that come about? I mean, what happened there? I mean... You know, with leaving brutal business was I'm guessing that was the you know the the guided choice of really where you wanted to kind of end up. Well, it's all kind of weird how I don't want to put everything happens for a reason. I've always kind of lived by that. You don't really know what's you know you you always have this vision in your head of what life's going to do, what not, and you think you know where the path's going to go and. When I was going from, you know, I never thought that I would be running a underground label at any point in my life. You know, that was something I never set out to do. It was just kind of one of them things that fell in my lap. And it's kind of like the one, one-time opportunity thing, you know. So I took it over. And the thing about BBE is I walked away from it with a lot of lessons, good and bad. I learned a fuck. It, it, it shaped me to be the man I am today in many ways, shapes, and forms. Not just as a musician, being in this industry, but as a person in general. Um, because the the thing is, you know, when you're in a uh, what's the, when you're in a collective like that, you know, when you're just the artist, you know, you're just kind of you know there doing your thing. You're there for you, you know. Put out, you know, work on your music, play your shows, you know maybe work with other artists and stuff here and there, but you know, you, you, you just kind of get jive, you get friendly with all the other people on the roster and whatnot. And something that was, a, it was, it, it was like a culture shock almost whenever the, the, the script flipped, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't just cool with anybody anymore. Like, okay, like I have this thing and there's a lot of sectors and there's a lot of parts to it. And there's a lot of people and it's like, okay, like, the, di- the dynamic changes, you know, you're not just friends and artists on a rock, you know, like you're the big cheese, you know what I'm saying? And every little thing, action affects you, be it negative or be it positive. Uh, and, and it's one of them things, you know, like if I was just an artist, you know, if somebody was doing some kind of funky shady shit, it's like, okay, that's not how I roll, but you know, whatever. But whenever you're, you know, you're the head <laughs> You oversee everything, you know, when somebody's acting up and being shady and whatnot, you got to deal with that shit because that fucks with you. And, you know, it, a lot of people, and I used to have this mindset and I try to be like this, you know, I just try to drive along with everybody, get along with everybody. But at some point, you know, you got to be like, never again will I work with that person. They, you know, it's just, you, you know, you set a standard, I guess you could say, of who you associate with and who you work with. And the thing, and I'll be real with you, you know this. How long did you have brutal business before I stepped in? Ten years. I ran it from the very beginning of 2011 until March of 2020. Um, so just over nine years, and then picked it up at the end of 2021 into now. So roughly I've owned it for a decade. The company has been in, in business now for about 12 years, okay. almost 12 so years. The, the thing about it is, and there's a lot of shit that happens behind the scenes that people don't see. You know, I didn't, oh, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't fill in the artists on everything that was going on. You know, at first I was kind of like, Oh guys, I'm working on this and I'm working on this and this for us, you know? But the thing is, is shit doesn't always pan out. 
people aren't always consistent enough to snuff, you know, you know, just shit falls through the cracks. Business deals don't always work out, you know. So I kind of was like, okay, whenever something is actually coming to fruition, I would share it. And the, the thing is, is like for every one good thing that I did that I had to share or was able to help an artist out with, 15 things fell through the cracks. And, you know, that's money down the drain. You know, and the artist, you know, they all, you know, I'll just be real with you. You know, the artist pay to do every year, $80 due. Yeah. And in, and in the artist world, that ain't fucking shit. Well, I'm like, trying to keep it fair, man. I mean, I, that was the I, thing is people bitched about it. I'm like, listen, for real, if you're bitching to me right now about paying $80, $80, folks, if you're listening out there, I want you to laugh out loud and go, ha, 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 because that's fucking retarded. $80. A year for management, promotion, shows, and opportunities. Now, were we the greatest label in the world? Fuck no. But were we better than most out there in the underground region that were willing to take on artists that no one else wanted to? Fuck yeah. 80 bucks a year. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I spent thousands. And if you look over my career from starting in 2000 and I don't know, 2001. We'll go back from my death metal days. 2001 until I walked away from music in 2020. 19 years. Shit you not, I spent easily 60, 70 grand on my music and recording and promotion and marketing and shows and fuel and gas and merch. And you know what? People say 70 grand. Holy fuck. 70 grand ain't shit. I wipe my ass with that. Fuck that. So when you talk about 80 fucking dollars a year and i had an artist being like well i don't know if i can pay you 80 bucks you're fucking worthless and i'll say it right now i gave love to the people that were on the label i wish you the best in everything you do but will i say that some of you were fucking pathetic and the fact that you came at me that you couldn't pay 80 dollars which makes me think you're a fucking joke as a human being yes Absolutely. I'll say that tonight clear as fucking day on the radio. If you can't come up with $80 in 12 months, you are a fucking hack, and you should quit doing your music, and you should just go to bed. Just go jerk off and go to fucking sleep because you're fucking useless. And that's all we ask for from our artists, folks. And it's being said now because Brutal Business doesn't have artists anymore, so who gives a shit? But 80 <laughs> bucks. $80. 80 dollars 80 fucking bucks. 80. It should be 800. It should be 800 fucking dollars. And even still, $800 a year for fucking promotion and marketing and a label isn't nothing. Now, some people could say, well, why is an artist paying the label? Well, because we didn't ask for rights of your music. We didn't ask for rights of anything. We were just simply a family that helped one another, that took care of one another, and watched after one another. And to have that family and to have that protection and to have that realm and the promotion and the opportunity that people who weren't doing it for themselves could then get from a group only costs you $80 a month or $80 a year. Fuck, it should be $80 a month. Um, what's that equate to, Patrick? Let's look. 80 bucks divided by 12. That is seven, not even, 667 a month. If you can't pay six sixty seven a month to your label to get promoted and follow your dreams, when you can pay fifteen dollars a month for Netflix, then suck a dick and quit making music. Go ahead and continue with your statement, Patrick. Uh, I was just thinking it. Well, whenever whenever I took over, we kind of we kind of made like a which it was pretty much kind of already this way. You know, when you had it, it was just different people. But uh, we made kind of like a one stop shop. Like we brought got. DKM was kind of out of the production side of things on uh, by that point. He was kind of living his life and doing his thing. He worked with artists like Ghost of the Demented and Kill a Noise still. Um, we brought in Gus. And, dude, like, it, it was because I wanted I, I wanted a bit more of a hand on the quality that I knew was going on. I knew the guys were going to go to Gus. You know, those that went to him, they were going to get a good product, good sounding product, quick turnaround time. And Gus gave them a discounted rate, you know, so we had quality control. Uh, we had people doing photography and videography. Uh, shout out to Last of a Dying Breed, uh, the guys in Skies of Terror as well, because they do all that shit. Um, we, we had a plethora of different people doing shit behind the scenes and whatnot. But my main goal was to everybody was able to get their essential needs at a cheap price with people they could trust and work with. Um, 
and then, you know, help them try to get on the bigger shows that were coming through town and whatnot. And, you know, we, we had a lot of success with that. I, you know, and it, it, the, you know, there was, there was a lot of bullshit, but there was a lot of good stuff too. Um, but the thing of it is, is like me, myself, I'm a very active musician, recording and performing artist. I have a family, you know, uh, and I, you know, work a day, day and night job, you know, we're working that mill life. You know, there were a lot of times I work 14 to 16 hour days. And fortunately with my job, I can send out emails, reply to messages and whatnot, you know, but it was just like never ending a year and never a half ending. of never ending. And it, you know, and, and for a while I was good with it. I was like, hell yeah, hell yeah. But as time went on, you know, we've talked about this in, in many of our talks, you know, in the past, you know, you start to tear, but that tear a little bit more every day, you know, it, it just tear, you just rip a little bit more. And then it gets to the point where you're, you, you're not repairable. And I, I was at a breaking point and I've, well, I, it was on my mind for like six months to walk away from PBE and there was no malice or anything behind it. It was just something like my sanity can't take it anymore. I got too much on my plate. And, you know, meanwhile, you know, and this isn't to be cocky or anybody, but I was still re- doing all that and running circles around the artists. I was still playing shows. I was putting out banger materials. Uh, you know, I was getting in publications and getting shit like that Nyla 666 track and stuff like that, you know, and doing all kind of features and collabs. And it just kind of came to a point where it was like, I need to stop. I need to sit down. I need to breathe. And I need to step away. Everybody will be able to find a home. You know, where they'll go off and do their own thing, whatever, you know, but it was like, I, I, me and Skippy need to sit down and have this talk just because I am ripped. I am torn. (laughs) And and that's it though, man, is, I mean, the thing is, is like I said, heavy is the head that wears the crown and everybody wants to be king until they're given that crown. And I'm not saying you, I'm saying in general, because there's so many people that have opinions that I should have been the one or I could have done it. Could you have? Because from an outside standpoint, I'm watching you fuck up your own life. I'm watching you not even maintain your own castle. So when I watch you can't even maintain your own shit, how are you going to maintain the shit of 35 other people? And everybody wants to think they're more special than they are. So you have people that are like, I could have done a better job. Could you? Could you? Because when I look at your shit being run faulty, when I look at you not being able to hold down your kingdom personally, let alone outside exterior, then I have to question that. And there was no one fit to run this kingdom other than you. And I knew that even when I gave it to you, that eventually there'd be a day that you'd walk away from it. I know that sounds crazy, but I knew that. That's why I made the contingency that when when and if you were to walk away, that I would take back over it. Because I know that it would get to any man. And I knew that it got to me. Now, it took a long time to get to me because I'm just stupid. and I should have let it get to me a long time ago. But I knew that there would be a day that you'd say, fuck this. But I knew that the experience and the torture that you went through would help build who you were. And that is something that no one else could ever teach unless you experienced it. So I wanted you to have the lesson because that'll stick with you now. That'll stick with you five years from now. That'll stick with you 50 years from now. Hard and lessons learned harder, my friend. Hard it, lessons learned harder. It is. And the thing is, is they're all great people in their own right. They're all nice. Everybody that was on Brutal Business was a good individual or they wouldn't have been on Brutal Business. But do they have what it takes to be something big? No. Most of them don't. And that's why I made, made Brutal Business. I took good people who had good talent, who had a good heart who didn't know how to promote themselves, who didn't know how to market themselves, or maybe they did, but I'm saying in a lot of cases they didn't. And I gave them a home and gave them a place that they could have a family and build together. But in that realm of comfort became cockiness by a lot of them. And they're like, I'm a badass motherfucker. Are you? Because if you step outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or the little small town that you live in, wherever it might be, does anybody really give a shit? Because we all like to think we're important. I'll tell you firsthand, I'm a fucking nobody, and I'm fine with that. I'm, in fact, I embrace it. 
I'm a nobody that has a lot of things to say, but I'm a nobody. But we somehow get lost in our own ego. and We like to say, oh, well, I, I, played sh- I played shows with fucking, you know, Tech 9, and I played shows with Twisted. Who the fuck cares? Because you're bragging to everybody you know that you played shows with Tech 9 and Twisted. But is Twisted and Tech 9 bragging that they played shows with you? If the answer is no, then shut like the fuck the up. Said that. I like the way you said that. Because, well, like, being somebody who went, because I, I never started opening for major label acts until I got into Nine Stitch. And, it, like, I never, like, I never looked at it that way. Like, I, and not to sound like a prick, that's kind of a local, local mentality, like local artist mentality. Like, oh, yeah, well, I, like you said, like, oh, I opened up for so-and-so at the Hard Rock Cafe. It's like, like, that's cool and all. Good for you. It's an awesome opportunity, and it's going to be a fun time. But, like, everybody's done it. Everybody opens for somebody like, you know, you're working to get to that point where, oh, well, I had so-and-so open for me. That's the way I look at it personally. But it's just like, calm down, dude. <laughs> you don't need to roll hard in the yard. Just do your shit. Enjoy the things that are, you know, happening before you and just keep moving on to the next level. That's all you can do. Lose the ego. Stay humble. Don't be a prick. Well, and my thing was, I always tried to be, I was always a dick, but I always tried to be humble, even though I was a dick. And people would find that hard. They're like, oh, this dude's a cocky asshole. I'm like, no, actually, I'm not. I'm very humble, but I'm also a dick. And how do you run them both of those lines? I don't know, but I did it because I never gave a shit that I opened up for anybody. In fact, I turned down so many headliner shows. Most of the headliner shows I took was because everybody else was like, oh, let me on it with you and let me do it. Let's do this show. And like, and they made it a bigger deal than it was. I never gave a shit. Like, I, I opened up for Tech 9 I opened up for Machine Gun Kelly. I opened up for Wu-Tang Clan. I don't give a shit. None of that means a fucking thing. Because, folks, if you're listening out there, you know what that means when an artist tells you that they opened up for someone? It means that they took on a quota of selling a shit ton of tickets in most cases. Now, sometimes I got away for free and didn't have to open up for anything. Like, Machine Gun Kelly, I didn't sell a fucking ticket. I didn't do anything. I literally actually... Played be after Machine Gun Kelly. So if you want to get technical, Machine Gun Kelly opened up for me. Do I give a shit about that? No, because I don't give a fuck about Machine Gun Kelly. I don't even like him. So, you know, like, that doesn't mean anything. But, I mean, people will try to use these as bragging rights. And they'll be like, oh, I played with fucking Twisted. Cool. How many hundreds of dollars did you sell to play with Twisted? Did you sell 30 tickets or 50 tickets at $20 a piece to turn it into a promoter? to play for 15 minutes at 5.30 in the afternoon. Because I'm guessing you're probably saying, yeah, right now. So congratulations, you made a promoter three fucking four grand off your ticket sales, whatever the number comes out to right now, to play at 5.30 in front of 15 fucking people or that are the same 15 assholes that follow you to every fucking show that you play. You accomplish nothing. Your fucking self-masturbatory act of fucking ego inflation is disgusting to me. You're not a fucking artist. You're a joke. And that is 90% of the fucking scene out there. And I don't care if that offends anybody. That's the truth. I don't give a shit who you played. I would turn people down all the time. Do you want to play with fucking so-and-so? No. You know who I want to play with? The asshole down the street that no one knows. I want 12 fucking groups that no one knows. Let's pack a building with all of our fans and let our fans find another act that they love let's have 400 fucking people in an underground basement show shoulder to shoulder sweaty having a great time with one another real fucking music not let me sell four thousand dollars worth of fucking tickets to get 15 minutes to play with a group that doesn't give a shit about me and people don't fucking look at it like that because it's all ego it's all look at my accomplishments you know what your accomplishment should be gain fans not Status. Now, if you're listening out there tonight, I'm on my I'm on my bag tonight. I'm fucking going in because I'm pissed <laughs> off about a bunch of shit. And I already told Patrick, I was like, I'm sorry if I go in tonight, but there's some shit that needs said because so many of you little cocksuckers are saying so much shit out there. I hear all you little fucks that never accomplished anything. You're nobodies, and I hear you bragging that you opened up for so and so. No one fucking cares. Accomplish something. Because if you if you set up a merch booth and you sell ten dollars worth of merch tonight, but yet you're bragging to me that you fucking opened up for fucking Tech Nine, what does that mean? You sold ten dollars worth of merch tonight, bro. 
You are a nobody. You're a fucking nothing. Accept it and grow from it. Don't go around and brag to people because I don't got bragging rights to anybody. I've done more than most of you ever will and I don't give a shit about it. It means nothing. I'm a fucking nobody. So what I'm saying, if you're listening, is support local artists who are humble. Soon as that person's like, oh, you know who I am? Walk the fuck away from them because they're not worth your fucking time. They're not worth your money. Stick with people that are true. And Dakota said it earlier. There's a reason that he signed Patrick after he left Brutal Business because he's humble. Because he's true. Because he's real. Because he's a nice guy first and foremost before he's a greatest, you know, a great artist. That's important. Because you can find a thousand assholes out there that'll tell you how cool they are. Find the one that doesn't tell you how cool they are. And just says, hey man, thank you for listening to my music. It means a lot. Because there's a chance that that person is going to be the one that makes it somewhere. Food for thought. Now, why don't we go ahead and jump into another song real quick, and then we'll come back for a little bit of final discussions. And like I said, if you're listening out there, folks, and you completely are like, fuck this guy tonight, good, fuck you too, I don't care. Um, This song is going to be South of Clarity, which is another project we'll recap on when we come back. We're going to stick around a little longer tonight, as long as you can. And this is called, and if I can fucking read my writing again, Songs of an Unconventional Hell. Here on Uncovering the Underground. We'll be right back after this.
All right, and we are back on Uncovering the Underground, and that was the project South of Clarity, Songs of an Unconventional Hell. Now, we've been hanging out for the last hour and a half. Normally, we'd be done right now, but I'm fucking, I'm pushing the two-hour two marker. One, because I'm with a good friend tonight, and two, just because I'm drunk and I don't give a shit. Now, one of the things I've been doing differently this season is I've been drinking. Now, you'll hear me in past seasons where I talk about the fact that I don't drink anymore on shows because there was a very wild situation with my good friend Don Arias, underground horrorcore artist where I got fucking lit, and I shouted him out, I don't know, roughly at least 400 times during the episode, and I was like, shout out to Don Arise, you know, shout out, yeah, shout out to Don Arise, Don Arise, shout out to you. Now, I don't know what happened there, it was, I drank hog wild IPA that went bad, and it fucked me off right after I got off the phone, or right after I got off the interview, I literally puked for like an hour, um, (laughs) <laughs> Which normally doesn't happen, but there was little, legitimately was something wrong with the beer. Um, now, I decided this season, and I even told my wife, I says, listen, every Thursday night, I'm getting drunk during my show. Because with Knights of the Nephilim, I can. I'm talking to world-famous occultists. We're talking about deep, esoteric doctrines. Celestial oddities. We're talking about paranormal and supernatural activity. It all requires heavy thought. Now, I'm not going to say that my guests don't deserve my utmost respect because they do when it comes to music and modeling, but I feel like I can let loose a little bit, and God damn it, I deserve to let loose, so I do it on this show. <laughs> and it gives you a different side of Skippy Ickum and Freighter Crow. Now, tonight I have a good friend on the show, so I really feel like I can let loose, and I'm telling things how they are, which I know can offend a lot of people, and if it does, please, please, from the bottom of my heart chew the bark off my big fat log. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Straight up. So I've been, I've, been, I've been waiting. That's like your trademark line. That's my trademark line. And if you folks know that, I got that originally from Lake Placid, which is just a great movie. Now, we're going to jump into a few questions that I ask all my guests. So we won't stick around too long tonight, but we will go a little bit past and I, I might have asked you this last time you were on, but it's always good to recap because different time periods in life, different answers, different feelings. If you had, Patrick, all the time, all the time back that you've put into writing, researching, playing guitar, singing, programming, everything that you spent into the, the projects of music, back to put into one other thing outside of music, what would that be? Um, probably my education. I dig that. You're the first person to ever, well, ne- not necessarily say education, but say strictly education. I've had people say that I would pursue, you know, nuclear biology and all kinds of crazy, crazy things, but you're the first person to ever say specifically education. So I respect the shit out of that. Tell us a little bit about what, what would you pursue? Anything specific? I don't know because I got I got out of high school when I was when I was in school. I had the mindset that I was going to become a teacher, and when I got into college, um, one because I my from middle school up until I graduated, I was either in a private Christian school or I was homeschooled, and so like I didn't I did, if it wasn't youth group, I didn't I didn't I didn't really see people. Or if I was going to work, you know, my coworkers and whatnot. It's so like I never had anybody to really jam with or, you know, that that world was just non-existent to me. But once, you know, I started going to college, like, dude, I walked around campus with my acoustic guitar every fucking day, dude. I jammed with all kind of fucking people. And I started meeting people and, you know, it was like, yeah, fuck it, let's jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of the turning point for me, you know, and then – uh, you know, I, I was like, "Fuck education!" <laughs> you know, I was just like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'll be, I'll work in a factory or something. But as long as I'm playing music and you know, trying to chase after that dream, I'm gonna do it." But definitely, if I were to take all that time back, I'd put it into education whenever I felt the field that I wanted to, you know, dive into. I'd, you know, sink my marbles in that. I respect it, man. I mean. The thing is we often get entangled in different pursuits of our life and we we step away from learning. Now, 
I am a big advocate. In fact, one of the biggest advocates of learning. I think wisdom and intelligence is the most important thing a man can possess. I don't care who you played shows with. I don't care how many songs you released. I don't care about any of that. But when you can tell me very intellectual conversations about, you know, anything from quantum physics to to, you know, history, to anything in between. And you know what you're talking about. Like when you talk to someone and you're like, oh man, this person is a well-versed academic. They know what it is that they're speaking about. They've researched, they're well-learned. I respect that. That to me is respect. Who cares if you can fucking write a song? That's great. Many people can write a song. But how many people actually take time to learn and grow? Because the seed of wisdom grows into the fruit of power. And that's what most people ignore. They think power is is ego stroking. They think, as I talked about earlier, it's ways of telling others what you've done and what you've accomplished. Like that gives you power. No, that only gives you power in your own mind. Other people will say it's cool while it's advantageous to them, but then the second that it's no longer advantageous to them, they don't give a shit. But when you can truthfully grasp intelligence and wisdom and intellect, you can grow. And even if no one else in the world cares, you know, and that is power. Knowledge and wisdom is power. So I respect that because I'm someone who reads hundreds of books. I'm someone who's constantly researching and constantly in ritual. And it's all for wisdom. I've never asked for material possessions of money and and. and material items it's only ever been for knowledge because that is the most powerful thing in the world is knowledge now dakota said i don't know what exactly he's getting at here but he says here how about this dude why don't i come on for an interview now i I don't know i think he meant to say here hey how about this dude I'll come on for an interview. I think that's how he meant to say it. I'm not sure. I think if I'm going to say it. And, and you know what, man? Next season, I'm down to have you on for an interview as one label owner to another, though I don't manage artists anymore, and God forbid I ever do. If I ever try to, please just shoot me in the face. Um, you know, you go ahead and you handle that for me, Dakota. You take on all that shit because I don't want none of it. Managing myself is enough of a task. I don't need anybody else. Likewise, dear God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Everybody's problems. As you said earlier, everybody all day long is like, so-and-so said this, and I have a problem with that, and can you help me with this? Like, handle your own fucking shit. I got my own stuff going on over here. Like, I'm here to help you with your professionalism. I'm here to help you as an artist grow. I don't give a shit about the inner qualms that you have with other people. You're a fucking adult. Handle your shit. But that's not what it is. Everybody's like, can you hold my hand and teach me how to go potty? Like, I have kids. I don't need more, especially when it comes to 35 other kids. I don't fucking need 35 more children. Two is enough for me, you fucks. So grow up. Now, Are you in the potty stage yet with your oldest? What's that? Oh, he's uh, – well, <laughs> so he's in the potty stage. And, I mean, and he, he is more than versed to go to potty when he chooses that he wants to. But then I don't know. There's this weird in-between stage where he's just like, Daddy – and he doesn't actually say this, folks, but he's like, Daddy, I shit my pants. <laughs> and I'm like, well, son, you know that shitting in the potty feels much better and you don't have to carry that around with you. Why would you do that? Because you know how to shit in the potty. And he's like, well, Daddy, I shit my pants. And I don't get it. I don't know. Potty training a child they, is, is fucking brutal, folks. It's, it's rough, dude. I'll tell you what. My son cracks me up because he's five. And he's he's very good about going to the potty. But, like, my favorite thing about it, this little dude is it doesn't matter who's there. It doesn't matter where we're at. We roll up into sheets and cranberry. And if he goes, if he takes a piss in the urinal, them trunks are going right down to the ankles. He's, like, flexing. He don't give a shit. Bare ass, everything's out. Just drops his fucking pants all the way down to his ankles in front of everybody in a bath. <laughs> It's like some kind of flex for him. It's like, dude, no, no, you don't know. He's like, nope, they go down to the floor, daddy. They go down to the floor. 
<laughs> I, I, you know what? Kids are so genuine, man. They do, they're just so raw and real, and that's why I relate to children because I fucking hate the fuckery of life, you know, and everybody's bullshit. But kids just tell you, man. I mean, even though it's in a kid like manner, they tell you. There's no. There's no hidden agenda. There's no dogmatic programming. There's no egotism that has had a chance to form yet. They're just living their best life telling you how it is, and I respect that. Um, Whereas most of you fucks out there listening, I mean, chances are you are so lost in who you think you are that you have no idea who you actually are. And until you grasp that, I really can't relate with you. And the the thing is, is so many people have liked my music and liked what I've done and liked the different things that I've been involved with, and I respect that. And I appreciate that you like it, but that doesn't mean that you have a golden fucking Willy Wonka ticket to being my friend. And that's some real shit right there that no one's ever spoke. Just because you're a fan of my music doesn't mean I give a shit about you. And people are like, oh, fuck, he just said that. Yes, I just said that because people think that you owe them something whenever you're the, hey, man, I'm a huge fan of your fucking music, bro. Yippee fucking do, man. I I appreciate that. But that doesn't mean that we're cool as people. I'm happy that my shit resonates with you. But doesn't mean in real life I would ever hang out with you. But people think that. And it's, it, it is weird to me. So it's like, you know, learn who you are first. Stop being who you think you are and find out who you are. And when you get to that level, we can start fucking jiving with one another. And that's why I resonate with real people. And I will recap once again before we finish out the last segment. That's why Patrick would be the goddamn fucking owner of Brutal Business seven more lifetimes in a row. Because I resonate with the motherfucker. I know who he is as a person. I respect it. Where a lot of you are playing fucking Willy Wonka. You're playing fucking characters you're wearing fucking costumes around me and i know who you are but i see who you're pretending to be around me and i see it you might not think i see it but i see it now last couple comments before we finish out the last question it said it's difficult when you have more professional people like pat it's a lot easier with that aspect. So I think what Dakota's saying is when you have a lot better, more mind like-minded people, here's the thing, Dakota, I always got good, like-minded people, but it just, you know, managing a lot of people. So if you found the magic formula, if you found the fucking, the way to, you know, create the never ending God stopper, I'm going to keep using Willy Wonka terms tonight. Um, then kudos to you, brother, because I sure as fuck didn't figure it out. I don't think Pat figured it out either. I mean, we had great people on the label, but when you mix a bunch of people together, it's just a bunch of drama. And then you find out weird shit about people that you like that now after you find out you don't like them anymore or you have a hard time liking them. I had members I of the label. The weirdest part about how, because I think by the time we capped it off at the end of 2021, I think we had over 50 people in house. And that's a lot we, of we had, people, we had, man. Yeah, we had, we had a lot of people, and the thing is, is like it's amazing how even like you and me, for example, like you meet these people online, and like yeah, like most stuff, and you play shows and whatnot, and and it's amazing the relationship and the friendships that can form and whatnot. But a lot of the times when you take that stuff away, it's like I don't really know that fucking person. I don't really know what kind of person they actually are. Like, yeah, like we play shows, we, we chat online and whatnot, but I really don't know what they're actually like as a person. It it was something that toward the end kind of was just like, wow, like, I don't know. It's not saying anything bad about anybody, you know, but it's just, it's weird how social media has transformed the way we as humans and individuals function among society. I'll put it to you that way. Well, And the thing is, too, how much do you truly know another individual? Because I had let people onto this label that I did what little research I could. I wasn't FBI fucking fingerprinting these people, but I would look into a little bit about them. Now, it's easy to change your name. It's easy to move to a different city. It's easy to try to hide your background. But what happens when people start messaging you and they say, hey, you know such and such that you have on your label as a pedophile? And then they start sending you police records. And you're like, oh, what the fuck? And then you have to fire someone 
instantly. Like, no, no fucking around. Don't care what their story is. Like, hey, bro, need to talk to you. Yeah, what's up, Skip? You're fired. Get the fuck out. Yeah, that's happened a few times now about people that I thought were cool people, about people that I jived with, about people that seemed genuine, who people who ended up being con men, who got very good at making people believe they were someone different than they truly were. Now, that happens a lot. And unfortunately, when it comes to the pedophilia touching kids things, there's a lot of these motherfuckers out there. And if you ask me, every one of them should have their throat slit and fucking buried in an unmarked grave. And I don't, I don't fucking have a problem saying that. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would fucking want to red flag me for that or, you know, in nowadays age, oh, he's offensive. Well, you're fucking right I am. If you touch children, you should get a bullet in your fucking forehead and burned. And there was a few of them that were on my label over the years. And I'm the first one to tell you because I don't hide this shit. I don't try to sweep it under the rug as if it was like, let's not talk about it. No, let's talk about it. There's motherfuckers out there that touch kids that want to be in the music scene and don't think that shit's going to come out. It's going to come out, folks. And when it does, you're done. Rear Ted. I mean, that's it. When it comes out, you ain't doing music no more, bro. You ain't playing shows no more. You ain't releasing music no more. You ain't got no more fans, and you'll be lucky if you don't get beat the fuck down. And if you do, I'm happy that it happened. I promote it. I'm not telling you folks out there listening to go out and beat your local pedophile, but if you do, I mean, hey, that's all I can say without getting incriminating of myself. Now, you know, let's ask the last question of the evening. Because we went off on some tangents tonight, and that's okay. Because every once in a while, especially with friends, it's nice to just fucking let loose and just tell you cocksuckers how it is. And tonight, we're going to finish with the same question I finished with most guests. Patrick, if you had choice A or B, you had the chance to hold your loved ones, hug them, kiss them, have them near and dear to you, in the last moments of your life, but you weren't allowed to write down or say anything, no actual communication other than physical touch, or B, you can tell them verbally anything that you want to tell them, but you're separated by a barrier. So that in those last moments of life, you don't get to hold your children or your wife You don't get to hug them or embrace them, but you can say everything that your heart desires to them. What do you pick, touch or tell? I pick touch. 100%. and, you know, and that's become the common de- denominator of amongst pretty much everybody. I mean, they're, every once in a while you have that individual says, listen, man, I got to tell this motherfucker everything I got to tell him before I go. You know, I don't need to hug him. I just need to tell him. I need them to know. Um, and I'm kind of riding in between there. I mean, I would pick touch too. Um, but I'm a verbal person, as you, t- as you can all tell. I like to talk. I would just want to tell everybody what the fuck I have to say before I go. But at the same time, as as some of my guests have said, looking that person in the eye, hugging them, you don't actually have to say anything. Because if they're that close to you, that simple look in their eye, they'll know exactly what it is you're saying without saying it. 100%, my friend. 100%. Now, with that being said, tell the folks out there where they can check you out what it is you have upcoming for them that we might not know about that you're willing to share and any other news that you have before we close out for the evening. Okay. I'm going to dig out the old laundry list. So, uh, you can check out, I'll go through some of the other projects and stuff I'm involved in too. Uh, you can check out non stitch method on Facebook, Instagram. We're on YouTube. We're on all the major streaming platforms. Same thing with C's. Uh, we're both on both projects are on di records right now uh seethe i just released my newest single why um my next album lucid dream will be dropping up dropping in the next month or two um i got a couple more shows for seethe over the course of spring and then we're going to switch into gears for nine stitch method so lucid dream out in spring of 2020 uh, some of my best work. Shout out to Gus Walner of You Think Music for his work he does with me on all my shit. Uh, Nine Stitch Method, we're closing in on a brand new EP. Um, and spanking new music. Uh, we hit the road 
here in June. Uh, we're going to be heading out east uh, as soon as all the details for that. They're not east. We're heading out west. We're on the east coast. We're heading out west uh, with our label mates, uh, Ultraviolent, and uh, KJ Hollow is coming on the road with us too. Uh, so more details on that in the future, but our next EP will be coming down the chute here in the next couple months. Uh, shout out to, once again, You Think Music, Gus Wallner. He is the fucking man. Uh, if you need any mixing and mastering, um, if you want instrumentals made of all different kinds of genres, metal, rock, lo-fi, hip-hop, jazz, whatever it be, if the man has an amazing knack for quality and his turnaround time is impeccable along with his prices you cannot find anybody better i can't stress that enough um the mary and drain project we will be i feature on about half of the songs on the ep doing lead vocals uh kaimo is starting to do shows uh he's the guy who you know orchestrates all composes all the music and records everything and whatnot um kaimo is starting to do shows he's doing the solo project thing live um check that motherfucker out he's an amazing talented vocalist and musician the mary and drain project you can find us uh i facebook um i think we only have a song or two on all major platforms right now i know if you find us on youtube we have a couple lyric videos up there uh shout out to di records dakota uh amazing talented roster a lot of cool shit coming up uh some of our artists uh, i believe it was uh dancing with ghosts they were just played on like aew um it's, it's just so much talent dude just go go check it out there's everything there's indie there's rock there's metal uh it's just uh, there's a bit of everything dude di records di records di records go check us out we got a lot of cool shit going on over there um Shout out to the boys over at Possessed Promotions. Uh, they're a company that I helped start for a lot of uh, underground trap metal, scream rap artists, you know, just to kind of help get them out there. I'm really not doing too, too much with them at this point in time, but um, Aaron and Keeney, who run that, they're doing an amazing job doing some cool shit. So check out Possessed Promotions. Um, I th- think that's a lot of what I got off the top of my head. At the moment, I've uh, got a lot of cool shit in the works. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on the show as always, brother. It's great catching up with you. and It's awesome, dude. It's been a good time. Well, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your knowledge, sharing your expertise, and obviously your experiences over the years. I appreciate you allowing me to just completely tell people directly one-on-one how fucking much they suck because they do. And and I love telling my fans that they can blow me because they can individually one by one. You can form a line. Now, with some of the upcoming guests, we got a crazy fucking finish of a season for you guys. Not only have we had already an amazing nine episodes, but we have Natasha Sarver or Natasha Michelle, owner of Little Shop of Lilith, coming on next week. She is the front woman of a great band called Animus here in butler pennsylvania and she also is the owner of a metaphysical occult shop in butler pennsylvania as well longtime friend and we also have a project coming up that i'm really excited to share with you guys it's called chathulu dreamt and they're very reminiscent of tool slash dream theater slash something else they're about to drop their brand new album in like the next week they are phenomenal and it's not for everybody for but for who it is for you will love it i mean it is it is a journey of music and not everybody's into that i mean there's a lot of people that love tool there's a lot of people that say ah oh, tool's not for me same thing with these guys there's a lot of people that'll love them there's a lot of people that'll say that's too much i think they're phenomenal and they're great dudes and i can't wait to bring them on we have model Sarah Marie Polly, who is the wife of Jeremy Lee Polly, my first guest of this season. Phenomenal model. She's been published all over. She is gorgeous, and I can't wait to talk with her to get both sides of the spectrum of husband, husband and wife. You know, he's he's binding books and human skin. She's out modeling and doing wonderful shoots. It's going to be a wild time. So it should be a, a wonderful, you know, certainly interview. 
We have Knights of Malice, hardcore beatdown death metal. Um, these dudes are fucking phenomenal. I love them. I've been jamming their music lately and their album. It's great. Carbon Stone, another wonderful band. I can't wait for you guys to hear their new their new single, Scream. The shit sticks in your head and it plagues you. I have Model Miss Red, who is once upon a time a brutal business entertainment model, doing a lot of wonderful things and doing shot, shoots all over the country. Era Cabra. The Fall of Me, who is actually on DI Records. And we have right now comedian Lauren, and it's Lauren, L-A-U-R-Y-N, Lauren Petrie, stand-up comedian. And I'm working on finalizing the rock um, orchestra right now, which um, you know it, it's pretty phenomenal. Renaissance Rock Orchestra. Haven't finalized that yet, but if I do, that'll be one of the last episodes other than our season finale, which I haven't announced who our finale will be, and I will soon. So a lot of great guests on the show. Thank you for sticking around this evening for a much more in-depth, personal feel, not as professional as I normally am, which is great to just once in a while tell you guys to eat a bag of dicks. And and that's what you get this evening. So much love to you, Patrick. Thank you for coming on the show, allowing us to have a great conversation. And I'm hoping, and one of the things I'm going to throw out to you right now, is I've been getting a lot of fans asking lately. They love my unboxing videos. They've been asking me to do reaction videos. Now, I guess that's become a very big thing in like the last year, which, I mean, it's been around for a while. But people have been wanting to submit music. And they've been wanting to hear reactions live of what I feel about the music. Now, I thought about doing this as a radio show every now and again and playing a whole radio show, which we still could do. But I also thought about doing it as its own special thing and having a Facebook Live. And I would like to have a partner in this where it has to be unfiltered, though. For for folks out there listening, I mean, if you send me music that I think's trash, I'm I'm gonna tell you straight up that you are fucking garbage and I don't like it. I'll be real with you, Facebook Live ain't the way to go. I don't know how into Twitch you are, Never but like it. that seems to be the platform that everybody's migrating to. Fucking Twitchers. <laughs> all these new things people are like you use twitch you use snapchat and i'm like no i i don't but i mean I, I i don't know i'm not hip but we could whatever platform it makes sense on i'm thinking folks and if you if you have enough interest out there to want to have it happen let me know i'm thinking about starting a series it won't be scheduled specific days it would be we just you know let's say it's patrick and i patrick and i decide to do 10 episodes of an hour each, 10 hours, where we listen to your music, we give critical feedback of what we truly think. Now, before we, we would ever do something like this, you have to understand it's, it's true feedback. I mean, if you're good, we're going to tell you you're good. If you're bad, we're going to tell you you're bad. And I mean, it, and you can sit there and be like, these guys are assholes. No, if you're reaching out to us and say, what do you think of our music? It's only our opinions. I mean, it's only worth a grain of salt. Who cares what Patrick and I think? But if you send me garbage music, I'm going to say, hey, bro, maybe you should fucking stick to cooking chicken sandwiches at McDonald's because your fucking day job of or your night job of doing fucking rap music sucks because you're not a rapper. I'm going to tell you how I think, and I don't give a shit if it offends you. I'm going to tell you. So if, if someone wants true fucking feedback, doesn't mean you have to agree with it because one of two things are going to happen. I'm going to tell you you suck, and you're going to work to become better, and someday you're going to be great. And when you are, you can say that asshole is the reason I'm better. And hey, fuck yeah. Or you're going to quit doing what you're doing and go about something else in life, and we're all going to be thankful that we don't have to hear your garbage-ass music anymore. So it's going to be one or the other. So, I mean, I'm fine with either outcome. But what I'm saying is I'm doing this. I think this is happening. I've had a lot of people reach out to me to do it, and I've been looking for a partner in it, and I'm fucking just throwing it out there at Patrick right now, live on the air without him knowing, other than the fact he's knowing now, that that's an (laughs) offer. So if that's something you want to think about doing, think it over. You don't have to give me an answer right now. But I'm thinking about doing real unfiltered, not this Hollywood bullshit, not these fucking popular Facebook or YouTube personalities that do all these fucking reaction videos to get big. I don't want your money, folks. I really don't want your money, nor do I need it. But I'm going to give you real reactions. I'm going to give you that raw shit where I'm going to be like, hey, dude, you fucking suck. Quit making music. So... 
let me know. If you folks out there want to hear this, I'm looking to do it, and I'm looking to have a partner for it. And I will be truthfully honest with you as much as it hurts. Other than that, that's really about all I had for the evening. But other than that, one thing I do want to say, this is a special message from Angelic Desolation. Balls, tits. Balls, tits. Balls, tits. (laughs) And that's all I got to say. Other than that, Patrick, thank you so much, brother, for coming on this evening. As always, it's a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, I did say Snatch Chat, Chris. That is correct because I, I really feel like teenagers are just using that to show fucking you know, videos and pictures of their snatch. People are like, Hey, do you have snatch chat? I'm like, no, why the fuck would I want it? Like I'm fucking, I'm old. I don't, I don't, I don't need that. If you're just going to send me something, just send it to me. Don't fucking make me do all kinds of hoops and jumping through loops to fucking, to see it. Just send it. You know what I mean? So other than that, folks, thank you so much for tuning in to uncovering, uh, uncovering the underground this evening. I can't even talk and have a good evening, Patrick. Brother, I love you. Thank you for coming on tonight. Much love, man. All right, folks. We will catch you next week with Natasha Sarver, owner and operator of Little Shop of Lilith and Animus Butler, Pennsylvania Metal Band. And if you need me, you know where to find me. We'll catch you next time on Uncovering the Underground. Have a wonderful evening.